Um, benefit number three, it's going to improve our ability to engage in constructive conflict. Um, we've got some coaches in the room. Who at work, who likes conflict at work? Raise your hand if you like conflict. It depends on the kind, right? So um, there's kind of two types of conflict, right? Well, there's destructive conflict and there's constructive conflict, right? There's conflict that's good for us and there's conflict that's bad for us. What are some examples of constructive conflict? Sure, but also kind of how you do that, right? Is it more emotional or cognitive? What would you say? Cognitive. Right. That you have a much easier time engaging with somebody in conflict when it's really about the ideas, right? And you can kind of help keep those emotions, you know, not, not entirely contained. You know, they haven't washed over you. They haven't taken control over you. It's this destructive stuff pops up and the emotions take control, right? And then there are active and passive types of conflict, right? So what might be an example of active conflict? Fight. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. What's an example of um, passive conflict? Throwing your hands if I'm walking up the room. Totally. Yeah, the silent treatment. And so we've got all of these. So then what would be passive destructive conflict? Throwing your hands up and leaving the room, right? So that would be hiding useful thoughts and emotions, avoiding the conversation. Um, how about active destructive personal attacks when at all costs? Have, have any of you seen these in your organization? Is it, does this happen? And, and would you agree that all of these are very emotion driven rather than, you, you're not using your best, highest, you know, prefrontal cortex self like the lizard brain is happening here, right? This is, this is that really deep stuff, right? And then um, how about constructive active? What's something that you can do that's constructive and active? Talking, yeah. Just understanding everyone's perspectives. You know, expressing emotions thoughtfully, right, carefully. Uh, how about constructive passive? Listening. Yeah. Listening, reflecting, reasonable adaptations. Empathy. Empathy. Yep, absolutely. So there's this wide and growing body of research that shows that a regular meditation dramatically improves our ability to regulate and manage our emotions. And we actually figured out that a lot of it has to do with what it does to the physical structure of the brain itself, and that just eight weeks of meditation at 20 minutes a day actually literally reduces the size of your amygdala, which is responsible for freeze, flight, or fright lizard brain. It's this very deep brainstem thing, right? This, this is what's getting you riled up. This is the thing that protects you and keeps you alive. You need it, right? But we don't have saber-toothed tigers at work anymore, and so we need to make sure that this amygdala is getting balanced out by the prefrontal cortex, and that's where you've got your self-regulation, your awareness, and some of your decision-making concentration, right? So this amygdala is like this, um, this kind of time bomb that's kind of sitting, right? And it's this, the amygdala can actually put, in, put us in a state of fight or flight, or what some, some people refer to as an amygdala hijack. Have any of you felt an amygdala hijack before? Panic yeah, panic attack, absolutely, right? It really sucks. Right? And sometimes when you get an amygdala hijack, like you've got the, uh, the adrenaline coursing your system often, right? You just, you, you they really do get into a hyper aroused um, sympathetic nervous system response state. What do you do? Well, if you don't have any training, right? If you're just kind of young or immature or just haven't had a lot of great support or environment, then you get in that amygdala hijack and you take it out on everyone around you. Right? And it's very hard to develop a career, a successful career like that. But we know people like that, right? And then many of us, we have just enough awareness that we can begin to notice when we're getting that amygdala hijacked. And we can hopefully ex extract ourselves from that situation and say, hey, I just need to go take a walk. I need to calm down, let my body relax a little bit. It can kind of help regulate some of that. Um, and then finally, you get to a point where you can actually prevent that amygdala hijack from happening in the first place because that amygdala hijack is usually coming as a result uh, uh, from something that's happened to you in the past, right? There's something that's getting triggered for you, some sort of fear that might be coming up. And so as we practice and as we go on retreats, we begin to actually diffuse this time bomb. 
Uh, the time bombs have conditioned you to past traumas, things that have happened in our life. Retreats are not easy. Uh, Joe, on a scale of 1 to 10, how hard was Guenka? First couple of days, adapting was really hard. And then there was a zone in the middle. And the hardest thing for me, because it was silent, was when the talking started again. Interesting. Um, tenth Oxfording picture is the hardest one for me. Yeah. Back into the world. I hear that. So really hard at the beginning, kind of adjusting, kind of settle down a little bit for you. Did you have like any kind of emotions or difficult memories or stuff kind of arising seemingly out of nowhere? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Uh, Cindy, is this? Uh, yeah, mine, mine would be a little bit different because it wasn't a silent movie. Mm -hmm. um, but there was moments where we talked about our triggers or we touched on very mm -hmm. sensitive subjects. Um, and. I can still recall certain people going through a moment and you just wanted to allow them to have that space. Yep. Because if you weren't witnessing it yourself at that moment, you saw somebody else witness, you know, having a moment. So, yep. um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, uh, I think it's something you remember as you see people in the states you wouldn't normally see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So you know, we, we've learned these destructive, active, and passive approaches to conflict during our traumatic upbringings or other events, right? And this isn't something that we should be ashamed of, right? It's acting out as an expected and reasonable reaction for a young child in the midst of a familial crisis. Um, there's a little part of our mind that saw that in response to this situation, this was the right response. Um, but these can really, you know, a fight with our spouse can activate some of these same triggers from some of these childhood or earlier or other types of traumas and bring in this flood of this emotional response that really isn't appropriate for what's at hand. And so what I've really discovered is that as we sit, it brings us face to face with these parts of our minds and allows us to develop them into new, less destructive forms of conflict. Um, and that's what I wanted to share with you today.